This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science at the Theater's first fall 2013 event, New Biology, New World, question mark, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, head of public affairs at the lab, and I will be your host for the evening. Uh, welcome, too, to those who are viewing this event uh, via our live stream feed. Uh, Science at the Theater has a growing fan base around the country, and we appreciate your interest and support. Now, tonight's topic, new biology, probably sounds a little familiar. I think there have been several new biology periods in my career, so maybe we should have called this you know, the new, new, new biology. I, I don't know, but in any case, what I do know is that I think when the night is done, you will have an understanding about why we think this new biology moment is different from those that have gone before and why we are so really very excited about its possibilities and promise. Now, our guides to this new world tonight are four Berkeley Lab scientists, all seated before me here, Carolyn Larabelle, Jay Keesling, Adam Arkin, and Manfred Auer. And for those who happen to look at the New York Times online today, you will have noticed uh, there was a section at the top, uh, the science take section with videos. And I'm happy to report or announce that in some of those you will see tonight because those were uh, our, Mr. Auer's uh, the demonstration of his work and we're very happy and congratulations to you that it was featured in today's New York Times. Uh, we're gonna have uh, two more uh, Science at the Theater events uh, this fall, one on October 28th and one on December 2nd. So if you go to the Friends of Berkeley Lab website if you're not already a member, please join. But if you go there, you will see announcements for upcoming events. With that, I am happy to introduce Jay Keesling, who will explain and define this mysterious new biology. Jay will then be back later in the program to close out the evening's presentations. Please welcome Jay Keesling. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, new is, is in the eyes of the beholder, and I uh, decided that new goes back a ways. Um, and I want to just describe some of the discoveries that have happened uh, over the last, say, 60, 70 years, um, and then talk about how biology is changing. And I've listed just a few important ones up there. Uh, the one at the bottom, 1948 carbon fixation. That actually happened here. That happened on the UC Berkeley campus and at Berkeley Lab by Melvin Calvin, where he used radio-labeled carbon dioxide and looked at how it got fixed into plants and described how plants fix carbon dioxide. And of course, that's the basis now for our understanding of photosynthesis. Um, and it's led to all kinds of discoveries. Uh, and, it, and Melvin Calvin earned uh, the Nobel Prize for it. And there's a cycle named after him called the Calvin Cycle. Uh, in 1952, the structure of DNA was described. Uh, in 72, the first recombinant DNA molecule was synthesized, so 40 years ago, um, we entered the genetic or the recombinant DNA age. And then shortly thereafter, it became possible to sequence DNA, and from that, then we've be, been able to read out the genetic code. Now, one thing I think that it contrasts these discoveries from the ones that I'll talk about in just a minute is that these were largely done by single investigators. Individual scientists may be working with a few graduate students or postdocs or technicians in their laboratories made these really important discoveries. And this is how biology has pretty much been done for uh, many decades. Now, this is in contrast with how physics has been done. And that picture on the left there is Ernest Lawrence, uh, the, the founder of Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And uh, he is really renowned for developing teams of scientists to work together to uh, start to discover the most impo important aspects of physics. And his way of putting teams together to do and to solve big physics challenges has led the way to all of these uh, big physics problems and, and uh, this big science in physics. Now, 
that was really something that was foreign to biology until the Human Genome Project came along. And we started to sequence the human genome because all of a sudden it wasn't one scientist doing it at the bench, but it was going to take many scientists working together in teams. In fact, we established entire genome sequencing centers and even divvied out human chromosomes to countries for them to sequence. So it was a huge change in how we do biology. And this led in 2001 to uh, the human genome being sequenced. And just before that, as a test that we could actually do genome sequencing. The first free living organism was sequenced, a microbe. Now, this changed how we do science and how we do biology. And in sequencing these chromosomes, uh, human chromosomes, in fact, Berkeley Lab was one of the pioneers in this. The Joint Genome Institute, which is in Walnut Creek, California, and run by Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, sequenced hu three human chromosomes. And when they completed that project, they then turned their attention to sequencing microbes and plants involved in environmental problems and involved in energy production. Now let's jump ahead to today. This is a picture um, from the front cover of the strategic plan for the biosciences area at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. This is an area that's composed of about 800 scientists, and many of those scientists work in teams. Tonight, you're going to hear from four scientists who are, uh, are doing work in teams, and they're going to describe research projects that are going on in their laboratories, but done in teams. And we really believe that over the next decade or so, that by working in teams, these 800 scientists can solve some of the nation's most critical problems in energy, environment, health, and in manufacturing. And so you're going to hear snippets of those stories tonight. So um, I want to introduce my colleague and friend, Adam Arkin. Adam is a professor in the Department of Bioengineering and also director of the Physical Biosciences Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Adam? Well, first of all, wow, it's really great to see you all here. It's an awesome turnout. And um, it's not often we get to talk to so many people about what we do. Um, I'm kind of a hard first choice. I work in pretty technical things. So I'm going to tell you kind of what my worldview is. Um, for tonight, in any case, I'm a contextual engineer. That's uh, someone who tries to work on how things that we try to build interact with the world around them. And that means, for example, if we design a molecule, how does it interact with its host, its cell? How if we design a cell, how does it interact with other cells and the environment around it? And once we do that, how does it interact with the world and the environment? Um, also, very importantly, is how does the fact that we're able to do these things make us interact with each other as human beings, both as engineers and as society? Um, and I'm trying to figure out ways in which we can study the engineering of biology in a way that allows us to impact society positively and builds trust among each other, uh, both as an engineers and as uh, a people. Now, I want to tell you why we have to do it. This is not. This is not something that we have a choice about. We are up against a number of big challenges in our world. Um, and so it's not bioengineering in context. There you are. Uh, this is a, you can't read little words. Don't worry about that. I'll get to the big words in a minute. This is a, I love two-dimensional graphs. I'm an engineer, so here it is. This is a, actually a report from the World Economic Forum in 2012. This is a group of risk ana analysts. They come from the government. They come from non-governmental organizations. They come from industry. They come from education. And they get together at a fancy location, as they want to do, and they begin to think about things that are in danger. Uh, and what you're seeing here is sort of the likelihood of an impact on this axis here. That's, so this is very likely. This is unlikely. And up here is how bad it is if it happens. And so this little dot over here up at this upper right quarter, which is high impact, high likelihood, is chronic fiscal crisis. OK, I mean, that's, that's not a prognostication, right? It's happening right now. Good. So I've circled a few things there, and I want to bring them up in big letters. Hopefully, there we go. Look, water supplies, food shortage, chronic disease, antibiotic resistant bacteria, a lot of the spots on this plot are about, excuse me, sorry, yes. This is my friend Mike, I often forget him. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm a gesturer, you know. So a lot of the things on this plot have biology in the loop. 
and not just biology in the loop, but biology deeply and intimately connected to the problem. Organisms clean our water and pollute our water. Organisms clean our soils and pollute our soils. Organisms are the pandemics we're talking about. Organisms are both a cause and a solution to chronic disease. And as a species that uses these sorts of ways of looking at things, we think that we, if we engineer biology, we can make some progress on this. Now, we're not the only ones. These, uh, an associated group with these risk analysts, a different group made by different risk analysts <laughs> um, from the same organization came up with the top 10 technologies that were going to save, uh, save us. And I was shocked, shocked actually by the list, but here it is. Um, Few things, you can see informatics, which means you know, using computers to do things, managing knowledge, uh, and, and of course, you know, things like wireless and enhanced education, all very good. All the things that you see that are in color here have to do with biology. Again, what they think is important, synthetic biology, which is really just engineering biology, and metabolic engineering, having cells make things. Green revolution, which is agriculture, and getting our plants in order. And then these things here, systems biology and personalized medicine, this is actually an information biology. This has, how do we take all the knowledge that we're generating, integrate it into predictions for how things work? Managing the uncertainty, managing all the issues that we have, and predict forward what's going to happen next. So for all of us, we're ushering in an era of personalized medicine where we measure your genome. As Jay pointed out, we can do this now. We measure a lot of your features as a person, as an individual, and from that predict what the best treatment for you will be. So these solutions, the idea that we're going to change biology, to, do, to, to, to help us, and that we're going to integrate knowledge is the piece. But we need these tools here because they are about knowledge integration and, knowledge, and uncertainty management. So the main points to take home from that are that biology provides a warehouse of solutions because, as I'll mention in a moment, there, biology is everywhere and important. Mm. We now have lots of data. Because of the measurement technologies that Jay mentioned, sequencing is one of them, but there's literally thousands of others. You'll see two beautiful examples tonight from Manfred and from Carolyn, and our ability to visualize atom per atom what's going on in cells at that level. The problem is that the data is complicated and big, and there's still uncertainty about it. Computers can help, but humans need to work together to interpret and act. Computers make predictions. Humans interpret and act. So going back to that figure, these are the things that we're talking about. Let me talk about people who have actually made solutions to these things. There's actually solutions to these guys. People have created for these top three things natural organisms that they've planted and stimulated to remediate. A good example, for example, is the first patented life form. You guys know what that was? That was an oil-eating bacterium. It ate oil. You know, why, you know why it didn't get used? Two reasons. One is people were scared of it. OK, it's a released organism. But second was the bacteria that live where oil spills happen, like to eat oil. <laughs> so <laughs> you just stimulate them a little bit and they eat it. Great, right? Um, but you can do, they don't do as good as we could do. And so people begin to engineer these organisms to do better and better. Extreme volatility in energy and agricultural prices, food shortage, and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Jay has been a leader in trying to build, have bugs build chem chemicals for us. They build chemicals that are fuels. They build chemicals that are pharmaceuticals. They build chemicals that are materials, that are, that are, that are dis displaced petroleum streams. And plants that feed those bacteria. And you have to build the plants to feed the bacteria because uh, plants have been trying to fight off bacteria their entire evolutionary history. And you've got to you know, rebuild them so that the, they can, they're edible <laughs> to those organisms. Antibiotic resistant and vulnerability, to, vulnerability to, pan to pandemics. We have microbial production of new scaffolds for antibiotics. You might, you might know that antibiotics are a real problem these days. We're having problems you know, in resistance and the like. And since there's a new viral vaccine, it's a spectacular example, uh, is, a, is a very controversial figure, Craig Venter, can take a sequence of a flu virus in China and synthesize it and make it into a vaccine in his laboratory in San Diego over the course of a week. The bits are transmitted, made into atoms that are the virus and are the vaccine strain, the vaccine proteins that you would make. It's an amazing change in the way we do things. And then a rising rate of chronic disease. There's two really, there's, we're beginning to get to the point where we can engineer our cells that live inside of us 
to be healthy. One of the most spectacular examples was by Carl June at UPenn who engineered T cells, your own immune cells, your personal immune cells. Immune cells that would be circulating in you if you had cancer. He engineered them by making these special, special receptors on them, these sensors on them that could sense your cancer and make them kill your cancer cells. And he cured people of leukemia using this thing this year. Amazing. People have also begun to engineer gut microbia uh, to, to, to cure inflammatory bowel syndrome and Crohn's disease and things like this. And you know what's really gross? You know what the best treatment, right? One of the best treatments right now is, is poop transplants. You can take poop from your, from your spouse and transplant it into you and you can get better. <laughs> I know, gross, but cool, right? <laughs> But imagine, imagine you know, you, you know, a lot of these bugs, these are things that can live inside you and protect you against infection, can protect you against inflammation, can balance your nutrition, and all of these things. And we're getting to the point where we want to engineer these things. We have to do so in trust. If I engineer it, it should do what I say and no more. If I do it, it should be safe. If I do it, it should work in the environment. So let's talk about bacteria for a minute. I want to give you some, some interesting numbers. There's 10 to the 30th bacteria on Earth. Bacteria, 10 to the 30th bacteria on Earth. That's, an, that's insane. That's, that's, 10 to 11 stars in the Milky Way, about 10 to the 23rd in the observable universe, and 10 to the 30th bacteria. You can put a bacteria in every star and we'd have some left over. <laughs> it's cool, right? There's more bacteria cells in you than there are cells of you. Actually, you emit, uh, you emit uh, 10 to the 7th bacteria per hour. <laughs> 10 to 6 bacteria, there you go. <laughs> Isn't that gross? Look, you're all submitting each other. Okay. <laughs> There's 10 to the 6 bacteria in a gram of soil, 10 to the 6 bacteria, 10 to the 5th species. I mean, these are competing with each other and, com and com communicating and hanging out. That's, that's a society, folks, right? That's a deep society. Um, there's 10 to 6 people in San Francisco. So that gives you a sense of scale. And we're one species. I mean, in fact, we're so close, we couldn't distinguish it. We can't distinguish ourselves you know, from each other really very well. We have to go very, very deep in sequencing to get there. Each microbe, each microbe is about uh, a micron. It's about a micron. There we go. Microbe. Uh, uh, it's about four megabases, four megabases, um, which means I can put 8,000 genomes in the flash drive in my pocket. Okay, not all the data about them and so on. And there are sense compute and do systems that are that are in a in a in a, in a micron volume, right? A femtoliter, femtoliter, ten to the minus fifteenth liters. They live anywhere life can be found, at the bottom of South African gold mines, the bottom of the sea in your nose, everywhere. And there are short programs that have solved the problem of living anywhere life can live and transforming those environments and protecting those environments and destroying those environments. And they do so using a coterie of macromolecules that do the job. And those include uh, about in one cell, 10 to the third proteins, about 10 to the seventh interactions among those proteins that create the dynamics that are you. All your cells are interacting through these molecules. All these molecules interact to create the dynamics. Now, there's about 60,000 different classes of protein that exist worldwide across all 10 to the 30th bacteria. That's about how many classes there are. And they can be arrayed in all these different ways to create all the different life that you see on Earth. Yeah, yeah. So what has been changing? Technology for measurement and manipulation. What you're seeing here is a graph. This is what's called a Moore's Law graph, and that is log log. This is time in years. This is cost in base pairs. And this is the cost of sequencing. So it's dropping exponentially. I can sequence you today. This is synthesis. I can build DNA much, much faster. So I can read and write at extremely, extremely high rates. I have, new I have new functional assays, so I can measure how things work. And you'll see some spectacular examples of imaging in this case. And that means that we can, we can follow these individual cells. And unfortunately, you can't see that movie very well, but as it gets later in this movie, you'll start seeing this is, all this is growth from a single cell of a single colony of, a, of, a back, of something called Bacillus subtilis that is like a, a spore former like anthrax is. Anthrax is a distant cousin. And the point is that this community of cells diversifies into a whole bunch of different types of cells doing different things in space and time. And we can measure all that now. And the question is, can we put it together? And what we've been doing is developing tools to put it together. And so we take all these scaling tools, we put it through computational services, we all work on it together. And the inflection point here is in the amount of data. When I get a paper to review these days, it's about 30 gigs of data, about 40, different, 40 to 48 different algorithms applied to that data and a lot of people interpreting it. And so I have to figure out how to review those papers and make sure they're okay. <laughs> That's hard. So when we do that, we begin to synthesize these things onto things like this. This is actually a representation of 
um, metabolism, how your cells process materials. Calvin cycles over there. <laughs> And the fact is, is that what I'm showing here is that all this data we have arrayed on every reaction, every molecule in your cell, trying to figure out what it does and put it together into a dynamic model of how the system works. And the problem is that it's hard to engineer that because of all those interactions. It's all about context. It's all about who talks to whom. Let me give you an example. This is an example that we, that we did. Uh, it's very futuristic. It's all computational on our lab. Where we, took, we tried to design a parasite for HIV, a viral parasite for HIV. This is a virus that basically cannot replicate on its own. It can, all it can do is hide out in your cells, steal HIV's capsid, and when it steals HIV's capsid, it can move to the next cell. But if you're not affected with HIV, then nothing happens with it. And we sort of figured out two parameters we could engineer, and then a clinically valid model figured out where we should engineer it to really have the most effect, and it looked pretty good. And we considered this, we had to consider the molecular interactions, the virus host networks, the within host population dynamics, and the epidemiology, because theoretically, if I gave you this therapy, you could have sex with somebody and transmit it, <laughs> which is good <laughs> and bad. <laughs> so think about it. Now, we didn't do it, but a co company did. A trial by Verixis actually built the thing went through phase three clinical trials, and actually this is people getting better. This is blood titer of HIV declining over the course of a year with this virus. It's an amazing thing, but it requires us to consider all the different levels of context here. So when we do these things, we think about how do we vary, how do we understand the environment, its host, the genetic and molecular interactions and the composition. And basically what we do now, we vary the environment and then measure their behavior. And then we vary the genetics and then we measure the behavior. And we, we, we vary our designs, we measure the behavior. In each case, we make models at each point and we try to project up. So in this case, varying the environment. So this is an example. Here we have a large-scale genetic variation in yeast. In this particular case, we took, a, we took an organism, right, and we downregulated every gene in it, because we can do that these days. We can downregulate every gene in the organism, and we can ask, how much did each gene allow it to do its job, in this case, produce a biofuel? And if we knock out this gene, for example, these genes over here, they made the biofuel better. And over here, not so good. <laughs> and so we began to make this map and what it allowed us to do is it allowed us to begin to optimize this particular strain for biofuel production in realistic conditions in the reactor. We could do the same thing. We could vary the host and ask how our designed implanted systems worked. So we implanted a circuit in the cell. In this case, the circuit glowed either red or, ye or, or yellow. And we varied the host and asked, if I, if I change it, if it's me or if it's Jay or if it's Carolyn, what, 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 does, this, what, does, this, what does this thing do? This is all in a, in, in a bacterial cell, so don't worry. You're not doing it in me, Jay or myself. <laughs> But you see there's a huge variation based on which genes are played with. Each one of these dots is a different gene. So this particular gene, if I vary it in the host, causes a big change in the expression of, this, of, my, of my system. And this gene over here, this next one, makes it go worse. So I can map this at a full genome scale, every single gene. How does it affect my circuit function? And then I can begin to design against it. And so for example, I can begin to design these circuits that, that know about all these interactions amongst all the pieces. And when they do this, I can begin to predict what's going to happen. And so, for example, in this case, if I do it poorly, if I do it the way people have been doing it for the last 40 years, and I try to predict, given, you know, try to predict look what's predicted versus observed, I find a whole bunch of guys who are outliers here. But if I use designed systems, I find out that I can get very good predictions. I'm getting to get that, get that be, be very, very narrow. And this means reliable engineering. I can begin to be predictive about what's going to happen. I can vary the parameters. I can ask what's going to happen next. So we're beginning to assemble this at a national lab into a system in which we can, for example, for chemical production, which is a nice, safe thing we can do. We can make chemicals that are of use to mankind. We can choose a molecule. We can design a pathway to do it. We can then measure all these things to talk to you about it, optimize it so it works as exactly as advertised, and then learn from our failures and then scale up when we're ready. And to do this, we have these large team science projects. We have the JGI for doing all the analytical chemistry and the, and the sequencing. We have JBay for choosing the molecules and, and understanding the pathway engineering. We have the ABPDU for scale up and the KBase for integrating knowledge together. And with this, it means we're trying to engineer not only for the effect we want, but for trust, making it work as advertised and no more. So learning about context is learning trustworthy engineering. So I want to thank my group. And then I will introduce my colleague, Manfred Auer, who is of Life Sciences Division and who is one of the premier people in the world in cryo-EM imaging. That was uh, very lovely. I, uh, I learned a lot. Um, and I, I say what, what we do sort of fits right into that. So what we do is uh, we 
um, measure and count, and so that's going to be very uh, important for the, the goal that uh, Adam has uh, put forward. And I guess I need to, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to do tonight is take you on a journey uh, through cells, and so to take you to new horizons and basically show you how cells look like and what amazing uh, things they are capable of. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna have uh, two communities that I'm gonna talk about. So I'm gonna, I, th I thought I liked the, this approach of um, it was the best of time, it was the worst of times, and that's been true 200 years ago and it's probably still uh, true. Uh, some things never change. But it's also the best of times and worst of times uh, in uh, biology. It's, uh, it's beautiful, we have this amazing amount of data that we can now generate, and it's really daunting what we're gonna do with that. Um, okay. So first, before I sort of run out of time, I want to thank my team. And this is really uh, a team effort. Some people actually here in the audience uh, from my team. And I really thank them from the bottom of my heart because they actually do the work while I'll kind of try to get money uh, to uh, <laughs> make this all work. OK. <clears throat> um, and also, as, as uh, Jay has pointed out and, and Adam has pointed out, uh, this really uh, takes a lot of collaborations, like a lot of very different people with very different skill sets, and we couldn't really just do this thing with sort of one, you know, skill set. So I'm, I'm even have an artist in my lab that actually uh, contributes to our research. So I want to tell you is um, why I think actually imaging matters. So if you just sort of look at this here, uh, and you get sort of a little set you can buy yourself, it's really hard to know that this thing is about to fly. And you only know that because you can start putting the uh, wiring diagram together, and you can start sort of appreciate what interacts with what, and that's how you sort of get to function. So I would argue that um, what we really need to have in biology is getting away from the old phone book and going towards sort of the Google Maps, where we really start to superimpose all this information on top of one another. And the way I tend to liken this is if I have the topography, the highway network, uh, the you know all Starbucks around me, and there's a traffic jam, I can make an informed decision whether I want to take a detour or want to take a, a, a get a coffee, and that's really where we need to get to. If with any of those informations alone, you would not be able to make this decision. You need them all on top of one another. <clears throat> so one thing you have to sort of uh, realize, I think, is that if we ought to understand life at all levels of complexities, we need to consider the very molecular and you know, Adam has been pointing towards the genomes and genes. Uh, we also need to understand the proteins, the gene products. We need to understand how the genes sort of work together as macromolecular machines. We need to understand how the macromolecular machines work together as a cell. And we need to understand how cells to work together in either a tissue or a community uh, to fulfill the function. <clears throat> and when you do that, you really uh, facing increasing complexity in scale. It's impossible to understand a human being at atomic level. It's too much information. You need to abstract going from level to level. And you need to sort of appreciate or need to sort of be okay with uh, a decreasing resolution, a decreasing level of detail the higher you go up, uh, go up in the complexity. And I would argue we need lots of different uh, imaging modalities, for example, to sort of visualize this entire process. And since you can't really beat physics and the tool set is limited, the only solution out there is to mix and match all the technologies. So that has a lot of problems uh, going with them. But uh, uh, what I really wanted to uh, start showing you is what actual cells really look like, because you have this sort of cartoon uh, idea uh, that cells sort of has nucleus and the Golgi and the mitochondria and all of that. But then you actually start looking into a cell, and that's just the tiny sliver of a cell. Here is what you see. This actually is a cell that, uh, that lets you hear. The rare reason why you can hear is because you have a cell like this, and it's complicated. It looks like the moon's surface. There are so many things going on here. It's really complicated. So the problem we're dealing with in biology, it's incredibly complex. It's not a simple cartoon, but we'd like to understand it at cartoon level. Okay, it gets even more complicated now if you get into a tissue, and it's a little dark here, but you can still sort of see it. Now all the cells are actually have different shapes, even their nuclei uh, are have different shapes. There's a lot of things happening here. So this is just about 20 cells. There is like, uh, like you know, a, a million times more uh, in every organ. It gets more complicated if you go into a tissue. 
Now it becomes incredibly difficult. Now it is even the tissues themselves are organized in a sort of a different, in a sort of, in a, in a, in a special way, and they all sort of need to work together. So we're really at this point now where we'd love to have a sort of a molecular understanding of something like as simple as a zebrafish embryo. We're not there yet, but what I'm trying to tell you today is we're getting there. We're sort of about to embark on those kind of endeavors. Okay, so what does it take? Well, the unsung hero always is uh, pay attention to preserving the thing that you want to look at. There is no point at looking at something that you trashed in the sample preparation. So we spend a lot of effort trying to get uh, a very good sample preservation. And what you can see here is um, you have a zebrafish uh, embryo, about three days old, or five days old here, and you can see that the different, um, the different sample preparation choices that we have affect not only the level of the um, macromolecules, and actually this is a little protein right here that is responsible for your hearing. If that is broken, you can't hear me. It's an amazing thing. But it's also the level of organelles, the level of, tissue, uh, of, of cells, and the level of tissues. So we need to get this step right here. There's no point to analyzing any of the uh, samples that have, that have sort of this kind of uh, uh, um, preservation. Okay, so what else does it take? Lots of money. Uh, these microscopes are not cheap. They're anywhere sort of in the ballpark between one and six million dollars. And the sky's the limit. You can e always add more goodies uh, to it. And it's really hard to get that amount of money. Uh, and, you know, and, to, and once you have the instrument, it's really hard to come up with a service contract uh, of all of that. So it's really little things that's holding us back. You know, it's not the big things, it's little things holding us back. So anyway, there are three different uh, microscopy approaches that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, one of them is you taking one object and you're basically rotating that, 140, uh, 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 take 140 images, rotating it from plus 70 to minus 70 degrees, and another one uh, this way. That's called uh, tomography, and that's very similar to a CAT scan, for those of you who are familiar with that. And what you basically do is you rotate the object and you get a three-dimensional view, and from there on it's all computational biology. Uh, or you take uh, a so-called focused ion beam approach where you work your specimen into a block and you literally um, slice off the very front end of the block and you just look at the block first, slice it off, look at it, and so on. It's really simple, but still gonna run you about $2 million uh, to do so. Okay, and then the other, and you can do either that with an ion beam or you can do this with, an, with a diamond knife, two ways of doing that. Okay. What it really takes, and that's really the crux, and here is actually where team science really is important. Uh, this is kind of the raw data uh, right here. And this is, I've told you, this is a little protein that actually runs between what's called stereocilia, and if this protein is broken, you're deaf. Not even hard of hearing, you're deaf, you can't hear. This protein stretches and it opens up channels on, uh, on, on one side, and that is how you can actually hear. So it's amazing that you have this little protein here that sort of you know, really is important. But that protein is not by itself. This protein has all these other contexts around it that it needs to function properly. So we need to understand the whole function. We look at the protein, we look at the entire uh, assembly. And we spend a lot of time analyzing the data. So it takes us maybe a week or two to get the sample prep uh, preparation right. It takes us a couple of days to get the images. And then it takes us a year to analyze it. So that is really what a bottleneck is. And some of that is because we haven't quite yet tapped into the ingenuity of computer scientists. We're working on it, but it's a hard problem. Okay, what I, so there's a number of things that we actually need to do. There's visualization. It actually turns out it's remarkably non-trivial to visualize a three-dimensional object. You would think it should be easy, right? Just look at it. Well, think of the Amazon forest and you're trying to find one tree. How are you gonna do that, right? If you just look at it, it's like many trees. They all sort of look alike. So what you have to do is you have to really sort of go in and go deep and you know, it's almost like a little video game you have to sort of navigate through. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of that uh, a little later. But the most important thing is, uh, so there, is, there are issues like data classification, data abstraction, we really get to simplified models. You know, once I know it's an actin filament, it's good enough that I know it's a tube. I don't have to know a lot more about it. Um, there's annotation and there's representation. That is really where, where Adam's work uh, comes in so beautifully. Uh, we need to make sense of this thing. So we have, we have voxels, we have sort of little pixels, but we don't have if the knowledge. 
And the major part of my work is really trying to go from that little image information to understanding. And that is where the, where the, where the hard work lies. Okay, so again, I, we can't really do this by ourselves. We can't really do this by ourselves. Um, we need to have uh, the supercomputing uh, a center, for example, that will allow us uh, to now use the supercomputers to visualize those objects, and we envision that now the entire world will be able to, uh, to uh, look at this data set, and we hope there will be some sort of a crowdsourcing. You know, maybe you know, local high schools will, you know, 10 years down the line, look at our data sets. That's a dream of us. Okay, I'm gonna show you two examples. Uh, one is the mammary gland uh, development in breast cancer, and then I wanna show you it's a delicate dance uh, for tissue integrity. And uh, the question really that we're asking is, how do you go from a pre-puberty stage to a post-puberty stage in the mammary gland? And while doing so, how do you retain a functional tissue? That's a remarkably non-trivial thing to do. So you can't really study this in, um, in the tissue. It's too complicated, there's too much going on. So what we need to do is we take little pieces of the tissue, we put them in a, uh, a, a, a three-dimensional culture system, and we stimulate them and watch what's happening to them. And what's happening to them is they're starting to undergo this branching morphogenesis. We go start out with about you know, 100 cells right here, and then they sort of you know, go out to about 1,000 cells or so. And while they do so, they make this branching structure. And I want to cut this really short, uh, but I want to show, tell you what we found. And this is kind of where the, uh, this new imaging uh, technology now comes in, that the very inside of this tissue is nicely preserved. And as you would expect, the lumen is filled. The, the mammary gland is not leaky. Everything is intact. The most outer part that's undergoing branching morphogenesis, that's basically the in embryonic development, is beautifully as you would expect it to be. But... The insight here is very different, and it's very different from what the thing has sort of started with. And here is actually where sort of the brave new world comes in. By imaging very large uh, areas, we're now able to look at the heterogeneity of this entire system. And we can look at the details, and for example, we found that the tissue, uh, the, the, the cell polarity has broken down. We're getting this very unusual um, membrane uh, 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 patches. And those membrane patches are, uh, are if you look, just, if the image is sort of in serial uh, sectioning, it be actually becomes uh, quite extended. And this sort of becomes sort of more obvious, I think, if we look at this here, where you can see here that these little flaps of membrane. So the cells are very loosely connected with one another, but what they do is they shake hands. So they actually has little dance where they actually sort of shake hands. And even more interesting, there are cells in there that migrate. So within this whole thing migrating, there are cells in between that migrate. And the most fascinating part of it is you actually can see, oh, so you can actually see the cells migrating uh, right here. So it's going out there, it puts a little production out there, and sometimes that production is non-productive and it retracts it. Say so like, okay, never mind. And when it comes to the outside, it usually comes back in. But there are conditions that you can introduce where it won't come back in, where it's actually trying to go out. And here's a desperate attempt of this orange cell trying to bring the blue cell back in. There's a lot of things we don't understand, but there is a lot of things we can do now, we can observe now. And the three-dimensional imaging is really critical. We also work on breast cancer. For those of you who have been at Mina Bissell's talk, we're working with Mina uh, on this. We get very exquisite preservation. We actually see uh, nuclear pore complexes right here. Um, we see individual ribosomes. It's very beautifully organized. And you have this pre-malignant, and you have a malignant system. And the cells are very close to one another, but something has happened. And that's what we like to understand. We'd like to know, how do you go from the pre-malignant to the malignant phenotype? What actually changes in the cell? That's something we really would like to understand. And in order to do so, uh, we actually are looking at the ultrastructure, but the ultrastructure is very sensitive. However, in order to do this right, we need to do this in three dimensions, and we need to do lots of it. Okay, here's an example of how the cells do this little dance. These are all little hands, little fingers and hands, and it's how they actually sort of go about one another. The interesting thing is normal cells don't do that, but cancer cells do that. And we saw that embryonic cells that sort of move do the same thing. Okay, 
here's an example where we're trying to basically map out the cell cytoskeleton. And we got huge surprises. I don't have time to go into that, but I want to have the huge surprises on the organization of those uh, cytoskeletal um, uh, elements. And we're actually entertaining the hypothesis that one of the reasons that you have cancer progression is because that cytoskeleton is altered. And this is something where you basically the cell is reading out its tension. The, the cell actually knows it's connected into a tissue. If we now alter that transmission system, we think that the cells uh, are thinking, well, we're no longer connected. Let's move on. Let's do sort of an embryonic development. And that is cancer. Okay. Okay, so the key now, I think, is to measure and count and really get an accurate account what is different between those different cells. That is what one of the goals that we're working on right now. Ultimately, I think this is kind of what Adam uh, uh, touched upon. I think we need to do observe, we need to make a model, we need to simulate, we need to predict, and we see how well our prediction matches the observation and sort of refine that model. And I think that is one of the novel things in biology. We're getting to the point now where we're starting to become more like an engineering discipline. Where we're making this cycle of refinement and doing better than we sort of did before. Okay, very quickly, and this is what the uh, New York Times uh, luckily uh, picked up uh, on. Uh, we have this microbial communities, and the microbial community, uh, bacteria here, they have a social life too. They're actually very social organisms. They actually don't like to hang out by themselves. Because if you're by yourself, you get eaten. But if you hang out with your bodies, you protect it, you know, safety in numbers. And the, the, the biofilms are organized in very complex ways. It's not like they're growing everywhere they can. They're making very distinct architecture. Nothing more uh, uh, um, fascinating, I think, than the mix of bacteria that make these very elaborate mounts and very elaborate structures. So they can be very close in a biofilm, which one of the reasons they can't be eaten so easily. And they secrete these vesicles. And they have this form of social motility where they basically, what they're trying to do is they, they, they move around like a pack of wolf, they find their prey, they're circling around it, and then they digest it. Just as simple as that. They're very slow, but they're very persistent and they're doing it very well. They also have adventurous motility. Some of them are able to move out by themselves. And they make these very complex fruiting bodies where hundreds of thousands of cells come together, single file, and make a mount. Very, very uh, a fascinating behavior. So we have discovered that these cells um, secrete out not just vesicles, but chains of vesicles. And we were really wondering what it was doing. So one of the things that we, that we found is that in those vesicle chains, and again, this is why team science is so important, because we're able to dip into these various uh, technologies that are out there. Uh, we found some of the proteins that are known to be transferable between uh, bacteria are found in those structures. So they're helping each other out. They're giving each other a hand. They basically help. But they also use those to kill. They actually use this to kill other people, uh, other species right there. They make this network. And so we call that uh, bacterial social networks, which is probably the reason why we got the play from the New York Times. And what you see here is that the, this uh, um, bacteria in this biofilm have the ability to communicate with, honor, with one another in a stealth mode. They kind of are able to send a message to one another and nobody's listening in. So, um, you know, one, one, one of the media sort of just said, like, it's like a general uh, using Twitter, you know, instead of, you know, uh, instead of uh, a, a, a secret uh, a, a, um, communication channel. Okay, I'm almost done. Here's uh, James in my lab. He's a very talented artist. His is de this depiction of what's happening here. So the E. coli cells, the guys in blue, use that to, to communicate with one another. They leave messages in a bottle for other species. They also leave uh, little mines, water mines, that other species may come upon. And they use it to actively attack another species. And to sort of make that point, oh, I want to come back to that in a minute. But another thing I want to tell you is Myxococcus uh, actually makes these colonies in this very uh, bizarre way. So you have these channels here of higher and lower density. When you cut through the very edge of that, you see they make themselves little compartments. And we, use, we know they use these little compartments to effectively colonize. 
It's like for the, it's a highway system for them. It's the ability for them to actually go out and everybody's going the same direction. What we actually find is if you no longer have this ability to make these structures, then everybody gets in a traffic jam and nobody's going anywhere. And you get run over by your, uh, by your competitors. In order to study this more systematically, what we have done, and I really uh, appreciate the, uh, the internal support that LBL offers uh, uh, some scientists for some sort of what they consider groundbreaking uh, research, uh, we actually sort of used um, um, acoustic printing technology to map out a pattern of different bacteria, different strains uh, pitched against one another. And some of them grow very close to one another, and some of them stay far apart from one another. And so we've been using, or we've been developing uh, this, uh, and I should say my colleague uh, uh, in the uh, chemical um, uh, science division, uh, has developed this new mass, mass spectrometry imaging, and we're combining that with fluorescence microscopy, we're combining with the electron microscopy, now we have three different eyes and ears on the same problem. And one of the things I wanna show you here is this is actually the colony here. You see some cells, all these little black dots are all cells here. We're coming to the edge of that. It thins out the very, very few cells. We're coming back to that region. And there's something in between before we sort of hitting the other colony on the other side. When you're actually sort of coming in, you see some cells and you see this kind of pile of trash. And we really don't know what that pile of trash is except when you do the electron microscopy it looks like vesicles, it looks like membranes, it looks like EPS. So this guy's erecting a gigantic wall of China. Gigantic. And we don't know how to do it, you don't know why to do it, and one of the things we're trying to figure out right now with the mass spec imaging, the chemical side of this, we want to see whether there are toxins in there, we want to see whether they basically uh, leave a, a tr or pen out a trail, an unpenetrable um, wall that you have to chew through before you get to the good stuff, okay? So I hope I have uh, convinced you that imaging is a powerful discovery tool. Um, I think we need to combine a variety of different imaging, structural imaging, chemical imaging, reporter molecule imaging, and I think by combining them, we're getting an understanding of biology like we never had before. And that's where we need computational people, we need all kinds of people. We need people. We need Luke. We need you. Uh, let's see. Okay. We need the 3D Google map. Uh, my hope and dream really is we can convince Google one day they're going to do this for us. Just, you know. And you'll be able to browse it and you will be know we're in Mixo land or we're in Bacillus subtilis land. And now we're in the inter interaction zone. But the computational tools is really one of the things that changes it. This is something that is really changing the game for all of us. Because by now we can create terabytes of data. One data set is a terabyte of data. There is no desktop computer that can handle that. We're creating now uh, data at, this, at the pace where you can no longer actually look at the data. And that's where the supercomputing uh, will come in very powerful. And of course, naturally, Berkeley Lab is right on top of it. Okay, thank you very much. I guess there's a, there's a famous one more. Um, I forgot, I, wanted, yeah, I wanted to show you this movie. So this is actually Mixococcus xanthus uh, eating E. coli. So it's Mixo, he's getting into E. coli right here, and he makes this rippling move. These guys have run out of food, they're making fruiting bodies. These guys are still under attack. These guys sort of go around. And it's just fascinating to think all the things that have to happen for these millions and millions of cells to coordinate their behavior. And if you think that soil or bacteria is boring, I hope you will actually never think the same way of soil. There is a lot happening under your feet. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, uh, with that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carolyn Larabelle, who is a professor at uh, UCSF, and she's also the head of the National Center for uh, X-ray Tomography, and she's also a, a member of the Physical Bioscience Division. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a new imaging technology that we've been developing at the Advanced Light Source, and that's LBL's Synchrotron. 
That's the big round building that you see when you look up into the hills. And this is really a, also a, a team project involving biologists, physicists, chemists, uh, computer scientists, and engineers. And uh, plus a lot of wonderful biological collaborators. <clears throat> so this new technology is called soft X-ray tomography. And it needs the synchrotron because that synchrotron generates the unique X-rays that we need to image cells. Uh, just a little bit about what a synchrotron is. Some of you may have visited, but there's a linear accelerator. You inject electrons into that linear accelerator. They then are put into this booster ring where they're accelerated to almost the speed of light, which is really fast. And then they're sent out into this storage ring. And it goes around and around in the storage ring. They're, the electrons are forced into the circle by magnets. And those magnets also, by going into a circle, um, x-rays are emitted. We then collect those x-rays, send them down these long tubes to what are referred to as in stations or working stations around the periphery. And the ALS has about 40 of those in stations, a wide variety of experiments being done all around the uh, synchrotron ring. And we recently developed one of these beam lines. We built the whole beam line and the microscope itself right here. It's a little bit bigger than your average microscope. It's about 75 feet long. Um, doesn't fit into your normal lab, but that's why we need the synchrotron. Um, it was a, probably about a three-year construction period. We just finished it in summer of 2008, and now we're starting to collect data. So the unique thing about it is it's very much like CAT scans, just like getting a medical CT scan. With the CT scan, the patient lays on this table. They're inserted into the uh, instrument. And images are taken all the way around the patient. In this case, we're looking at an abdomen. Images are collected all the way around the patient's abdomen, a number of images. And then they're computationally reconstructed. So you have a lot of very out of focus, not just out of focus, but impossible to interpret information because everything's stacked up on top of each other. You do the computational reconstruction, and you come up with a very sharp image of the inside of the abdomen. And you can see all the different organs, livers, kidneys, and all the different organs in the abdomen without cutting into the patient, which is a really powerful tool. Well, we're now doing the same thing, but on a single cell level. And that's because we have the um, x-rays that the synchrotron up at LBL is generating. So we'll do it one cell at a time. And let's start with an example of blood cells. It's very simple preparation. You collect blood. You spin down the cells gently. You then place the cells in a very small glass capillary. They line up in a row. You then collect images all the way around the capillary. We can't rotate the synchrotron like you rotate an instrument for a CT scan, so we rotate the specimen. We collect images all the way around so there are no missing bits of information. Do the reconstruction, and now you see inside of the cell just like you would inside of a patient. Now, this is just one single section, not a physical section, a virtual section through that cell. But you can see all of the information, whoops, all of the information inside of that cell. And the unique thing is because of the x-rays that we're using, we're seeing them based only on the organic composition of the cell. We don't use any stains. They're rapidly frozen, and that's the only preparation involved. Don't see any staining, don't use any staining, and what you're seeing here is based only on the amount of organic material in a voxel, which is a 3D pixel. So what appears dark has more organic material than what appears light. The technology that we're using is imaging in what's called the water window, and that's a region where carbon and nitrogen, which all of our molecules are made up of, the carbon and nitrogen absorb water. Our cells are roughly 70% water, they absorb the x-rays much more than the water absorbs the x-rays. So you see the, the x, you see the structures just based on how much organic material is in a voxel, not any stains. And not only that, rather than just a single section, you have the entire cell. So now we're flipping through the images of that cell like you'd flip through a stack of cards, and you see all the components in the cell you can see the nucleus here, the light regions and the dark regions. You see the worm-like structures that are the endoplasmic reticulum where proteins are made. You can see mitochondria, which is the storehouse, uh, energy storehouse, and all of the structures. Again, no 
staining, no chemical fixatives, sort of Berkeley-style biology, no artificial preservatives, no artificial colors. <laughs> I said, all natural, just rapidly freeze it and image it. Then, the other interesting thing about the imaging technology is that you get quantitative information. Because it's all based on how much organic material is in a voxel, you can plot the histogram of the entire cell. And so where you see high peaks, there's a large number of voxels in the cell that have what's known as a specific linear absorption coefficient, the x-ray measurement that we read from the full tomographic reconstruction. So it tells you a specific amount of molecules in a region, but it's also telling you how crowded that region is. So this re region to your left is um, a lower crowding, there's a lower, lower linear absorption coefficient than the regions on the far right. So the farther to the right, the more crowded a region of this cell is. And the nucleus is a region where genes are transcribed, and it's telling you that the region that has these active genes, where a lot of transcription is occurring, is lower absorbing. That means things are less crowded and transcription can occur. It's lower absorbing than the dark colored regions in the nucleus, which is where the silent genes are, turn, are located. So genes that have been turned off that you don't want to use are in the dark regions. So you get that information and you can measure a lot of different cells and we're finding that the difference between individual cells is tremendous, individual cells within the same tissue, et cetera. That linear absorption coefficient is also very handy. Manfred was showing you a lot of lovely images that you segment different structures out of the cell. Segment meaning color coding them, isolating them and color coding them. Well, we can use these linear absorption coefficient measurements to do that automatically, tell the computer to go in and find a specific absorption coefficient and automatically get that region and do a segmentation. So here we're seeing those structures there are the nucleoli where ribosomal DNA is transcribed. And then that region is where the active genes are, that euchromatin region. And then the heterochromatin region, the dark blue structure. And so now you get the three-dimensional relationship and you can see how folded that nuclear surface is. And then mitochondria, all of the energy producing structures in the cell and their 3D distribution. You can then add the endoplasmic reticulum. And we could go on and on and add more structures. And there's a large lipid droplet. So lipids have a lot of carbon. They're the most highly absorbing thing we see inside of a cell. And then some cytoplasmic material. So all of that, all that processing only took about an hour. So that's a real advantage of having that linear absorption coefficient to automatically um, segment the cells. So the whole thing, imaging the cell, takes about five minutes. Reconstruction can be done in about 20 minutes. And then the segmentation and 3D imaging in about an hour. So in one and a half hours, you have a lot of data. Here's another white blood cell. This one is a T cell. It's a little hard to see with all of the lights on, but you can see the surface of the cell and now organelles in the cytoplasm. And you'll see that when the nucleus is revealed, it, the surface of the nucleus is also very folded. And you notice that this highly folded region is always at the region where all those organelles in the cytoplasm are located. So why would it be so folded? Well, you can imagine that that's a way of increasing surface area so that information can get in and out of the nucleus, and a lot of information can get in and out of the nucleus and transferred from the nucleus to the organelles in the cytoplasm where it's needed. Again, all automatically segmented. Uh, another T cell where we've segmented it Differently, the advantage of this is once you have the raw data, the data from your tomographic reconstruction, you can color code to select specific organelles of interest, just highlight those, and Manfred showed you how complicated cells are. Here you just pick the structures that you want to emphasize, put them into the image, and eliminate the rest so it's a more simplistic image, easier to interpret. And what you're seeing here is the nucleus surface, again, highly folded in all of these cells. Um, yellow cytoplasmic uh, organelles. Now you're looking in at the chromatin, and the green structures are nuclear bodies, um, specific proteins that are in certain places in the nucleus. 
And then the orangish worm-like structures are the chromosomes. Another way of looking at that same cell, revealing different information, cutting down into it so that you're going through the nuclear surface now and into the nucleus to see the chromosomes and some nuclear bodies in green. And a lot of the mitochondria in the pinkish color around the cell. So once you have that raw data, what you can do with it is limited only by your imagination or the information that you're trying to obtain. Okay, we'll close that cell up and then move to the next one. We never damage them. We just <laughs> put them back together. Okay. This is another white blood cell, and this one is now differentiated. All the cells I showed you before were not yet differentiated. They hadn't finished going through their developmental process to determine what specific um, molecule they're going to uh, focus on um, making and using in their cellular process. This one, however, is completely differentiated. And there are a number of things you'll notice. The nucleus is now very round. There is a very elaborate network of endoplasmic reticulum down here. And a lot of endoplasmic reticulum up here, too. So what we can do now is look at the differences between undifferentiated cells and differentiated cells. And just as Manfred was showing you with the electron micro microscope data, we can look at these processes, look at the processes of metastasis, of, of cancer formation. Um, we don't get the same resolution that you get with electron microscopy. It's a little bit lower. But we have the ability to see the whole cell without any processing. And you can see those tubular mitochondria in there. And again, what appears dark here has more organic material per voxel, more carbon per voxel, and what appears light has less carbon per voxel. So it's also telling you about the crowding of each organelle, the, the amount of material in that organelle. We can also do things like starting to understand um, gene function. And one very nice way to do that is using the model system yeast. You heard a bit about yeast already. It's a very powerful model for understanding um, how genes function. You can eliminate a gene in the yeast, um, you can mutate a gene, and you can also color a gene with a specific flu fluorescent probe so you can study it in the living cell. So we want to be able to look at mutations when you knock out a gene or when you overexpress a gene. And what you have to do in order to do those sorts of studies, you have to first have an atlas of what's normal. So this is just our beginning, our atlas of what's normal at the four different stages of the cell cycle, in an early growth phase on the far left, uh, during synthesis, uh, second one, and as it's growing even more and starting to divide, these cells divide by forming that little bud on top, uh, the nucleus material doubles. It starts moving a number of organelles, including the nucleus and the uh, nucleolus and vesicles, into the upper part. And then you have equal numbers of organelles, important stuff in both cells. And then it will divide right here. So we have a whole atlas of normal. And we can now look at mutations. And we're looking at a number of mutations. Um, the data aren't published, so I can't show them here. But um, it's been a very interesting and informative process doing that. But not only do we get pictures, we get information about how many organelles are in each cell at each stage. What's the volume that the, or the, those organelles consume? What's the surface area of each of those organelles? So we're going on just going beyond just pretty pictures and getting quantitative information that, that you can use then to get the statistics you need to do a meaningful study. We can do things like drug discovery. Um, again, yeast, there's a, path, there's a form of yeast called candida that when it's non-pathogenic, looks very much like the yeast I just showed you, just a little circular ball. But when it becomes pathogenic, it sends out this long hyphal structure. And this is responsible for normal average yeast infections that we're all familiar with, which aren't a major problem, but it's a major problem for hospitalized patients. And catheters can become infected and those sorts of things. They, too, are very clever. And they learn how to avoid and get around all of the agents that we use to try to kill them. So some colleagues at Stanford are developing um, 
little things called peptoids that mimic our normal natural peptides and looking at the effects of those peptoids on the growth of these yeast. And you can see we have two peptoids here. This one causes major deficiencies of its ability to elongate, but we can also look at the changes in the nucleus and nucleolar structure. This particular peptoid also very much inhibits the hyphal growth, this long structure, and again, we can look at the changes on the nucleus and nucleolus. And here, in this one, you actually see that lipids have started going into the nucleus, which is very unusual. A lot of quantitative information with this uh, data, too. The nice thing is we can look at numbers of cells. It's very hard to get large numbers of cells with um, electron microscopy. This particular study was about 100 different cells. We've been looking at malaria-infected red blood cells. You can see the normal red blood cell on the left is biconcave. Here, this one was filled with a parasite. So we can look at the whole thing intact, and you can see the parasite growing inside. That's a membrane that's growing around the parasite, and you'll see as it starts opening up all the different components of this parasite inside that we can then segment and color code. And it's a great way to look at the effects of various um, malarial treatments. It's also a great way to try to understand how the, uh, the blood cells that are infected become so problematic. And one of the things that our colleagues were looking at was the structures here in red that are uh, called a Maurer's cleft, and it's the vesicle that the malaria uh, protein sends proteins to the surface of the cell that makes the red blood cell very adhesive. So they make a lot of very sticky proteins and they transfer through these clefts and get to the cell surface. So if you can find ways to stop that transfer, that transport, you could then use that as a, a therapeutic treatment. We've also looked at things like gene regulation of odor detection. So odor, and we're gonna look at this in mouse tissue. Mice have about 1,400 genes for olfaction. They finely tune the ability, and they're clever, more clever at it than we are, and they have a very finely tuned system whereby each cell expresses only one gene. And so you have to manage turning off all of those that you don't want so you can have just one turned on. And we were interested in understanding how that occurs Here's an olfactory sensory neuron. It's going to express one specific gene in its nucleus here, a number of different vesicles here. The surface of the cell, these are structures that go up to the surface of the epithelium, and there's a receptor at the tip of these that detects that one odorant and sends the signal in through the cell, and it's then transferred up to uh, the brain to detect it. So, what we did was look at the structure of each of these cells to make a very long story short. There's a specific organization that's required. This is just the nucleus. There's a large black, a dark brown actually, mass in the center of that nucleus, and that's where a lot of the silenced genes from all the chromosomes are localized. And that structure is critical because as that structure is moving to the center, the silenced genes are accumulating around its periphery. What you see in the gold are other regions of heterochromatin uh, that are around the entire nucleus. So that's the normal structure on the left with the silenced chromosome in the center and the silenced genes around it. If you do things to disturb that normal organization of the genes and the chromosomes, you then displace that uh, heterochromatin to this periphery. You get rid of this central mass. The nucleus itself gets much larger, highly folded, and all of the genes are disorganized. So it disorganizes that entire silencing. There are usually about five to six foci around that mass, collecting all of those silenced genes, and they come from all but one of the chromosomes, so it's not even a simple process. They've gotta get those from all but one of the chromosomes organized around that periphery. And if you mess with that organization, like we did here, and we did that simply by forcing the nucleus to turn on one protein. There's a 
protein called lamin B that's ordinarily in the periphery of a nucleus. These cells do not have it in the periphery. It's left the cell, and that allows this accumulation in the center. If you force that cell to express that one protein, that lamin B, all of that is messed up. So one specific protein has completely disrupted the entire organization of the nucleus as well as the function of the nucleus. So we can get nice structure function studies. And I should have said with the malaria study that we did, we've looked at about 600 different malaria-infected blood cells, so you can get statistics. With this particular study, we've looked at about 300 different cells. So you get the statistics. And doing, doing this, we have realized that the, there's an amazing um, difference in organization of each cell. You cannot overlay two cells on top of each other. They're very different. They can do the same thing, so there's a lot of things in common. And what we're trying to figure out now is what's critical for these normal functions? What things do they have to have in common to perform the same function? Okay, and I will stop there and uh, thank all of my colleagues. Again, a very multidisciplinary team within our group at the National Center for X-ray Tomography, as well as our collaborators, physicists even in Finland who are helping with our data analysis and a lot around the country, uh, biologists in Australia who are doing the malaria work and the wonderful support that we get from the agencies that um, help us out. And thank you. Okay, and now I'd like to bring Jay Kiesling back up on the stage so he can tell us about the work that he's doing. Okay. This is George. Uh, I met George when I was in uh, Kenya in January. Uh, I was uh, visiting an area called Kisumo, Kenya, uh, which is right on Lake Victoria. Uh, it's an area where 80% of the population has malaria. Um, George lives in this house up here on the upper right. Uh, it's a mud hut. Uh, they were lucky enough to have scrounged for tin for the roof. Um, and you can see that it's not in great shape. And the lower right is the clinic that I visited where I met George. Uh, George came in with his brother. George is about four years old. His uh, six-year-old brother brought him in because his mother was working out in the fields. Um, and it was really hot. Uh, it was about 95 degrees. And you can see that George is in a jacket, a, a long pants, and he's got a runny nose. So uh, the nurse immediately grabbed him, brought him in, and uh, pricked his finger and put a drop of that blood on uh, this little device right here. Very simple. Um, just put the blood right there in the corner, and then she took uh, a few drops uh, of a buffer and ran his blood up on that uh, test. And there's two lines that appeared there. The top one is the control, and that told her that the test was actually working. And the second line, the lower one, is the test. And that said that George had malaria. So uh, she then weighed George, and she pulled out a packet of pills, um, tablets, uh, based on his weight. And she said to his brother, uh, very carefully, she said, OK, I'm going to give him this first tablet. And then 12 hours later, he gets the second one. 12 hours after that, he gets the third one. And then he takes the rest every eight hours thereafter. And so she told it to his brother a couple of times, and they left the clinic. Uh, and then she turned to me and she said, you know, Jay, uh, she's, he's going to feel better after the third pill. And so his mother isn't going to give him all the pills, even though you need all those pills for a cure. Um, because she's not going to be able to get this drug the next time that he gets malaria. Because with malaria, unlike other diseases, you can get it, be cured of it, and get it again and again and again. There are even cases. Uh, in places like Kenya where people uh, get malaria six times a year. But this drug is really a cure for malaria. It's called artemisinin. Um, this particular formulation is coartem, and it's offered by Novartis. Now, uh, it's got a great history. Uh, it goes back to about uh, 150 BC. There's writings in uh, the tombs of some uh, uh, ancient rulers of China describing its use first for treating hemorrhoids, and then about 150 la years later appear writings 
of its use for treating fevers, presumably fevers due to malaria. And it was completely forgotten then until about the Vietnam War. Uh, the Chinese were fighting uh, essentially the US, North uh, and South Vietnam. And um, uh, the uh, uh, ruler at the time, Mao, said to his military corps, um, you know, the soldiers are getting malaria. They can't fight there. Uh, we've got to have a better cure for malaria, right? At that time, they were using quinine, and quinine was no longer effective because it was being so widely used. So Mao sent his metal corps out. They couldn't find a cure until they read through the literature. And as they read through the literature, then they tried these various extraction methods for getting this drug, artemisinin, from this plant, Artemisia annua, or wormwood, or sweet annie, as it's known. That cure for malaria was then characterized, the active ingredient was found, and it's called artemisinin, and that's the structure of artemisinin. Um, this plant grows in many parts of the world. In fact, um, in many parts of the US, it's a weed. Um, but there are certain varieties of this plant that produce artemisinin in relatively high quantities, enough that you can extract uh, from the plant and produce a medication. So what happens right now is this plant is grown in plantations, uh, very large plantations now in China. It was first grown in Vietnam where the disease was uh, prevalent. Uh, malaria has pretty much been wiped out from Vietnam. Uh, those plantations grow large quantities of this drug. They purify it from the plant. Uh, it used to be purified from the plant using gasoline because that was the only solvents they had available, but now they actually have solvents because they're doing this in large plantations. They extract the drug and then they sell it to the pharmaceutical companies that then formulate it into these therapies that then are used for treating malaria. And any one of these can be a cure for malaria. Now the challenge is that if you're a pharmaceutical company, um, you uh, want to predict how much drug you're going to need, and so you're going to put an order out for artemisinin. And uh, you'll put that order out about 18 to 24 months in advance of when you need it. In fact, the pharmaceutical companies right now that are making artemisinin combination therapies employ economists to predict how much artemisinin they'll have so that they know they'll have enough available. Unfortunately, they're not very good at it. And, and this plot shows uh, the challenges in producing artemisinin combination therapies. So in red is the artemisinin price, and in blue is the artemisinin supply. Um, so uh, the drug was discovered in about 1972, but it took till about 2003 for the World Health Organization to recommend it as the drug of choice for treating malaria. And immediately there was huge demand for the drug and the price shot way up to about $1,100 a kilogram. Farmers started planting it like crazy because all of a sudden it was affordable for them to switch from planting food to planting artemisinin. And so they grew the plant. In fact, they grew so much of it that there was an oversupply by 2007 and the price went way down. Of course, that meant that later on they weren't going to plant it anymore because there was no longer a market. And this is the challenge that children like George face in Africa. It might be available today, but tomorrow it might not be available. Turns out that this year, 20, 2013, there's an oversupply of artemisinin because the crops have been grown so well and the price is going to plummet, which means that next year or the year after there won't be enough. So a few years ago, my colleagues and I uh, got a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We engineer microbes to produce chemicals, as Adam said, and we decided that we ought to be able to produce this chemical, artemisinin, by engineering microbes to produce it. So we went to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and got a grant for $42 million to engineer microbes to produce this drug. And, and the, the proposition to the Gates Foundation was simple. We're gonna take the genes in the plant that naturally endow the plant with the ability to produce artemisinin and transplant them into a yeast. So rather than producing ethanol, um, you would grow up this yeast in large vats and they'd produce artemisinin, growing on sugar. We'd extract it from those fermentations and we'd deliver it to people in the same way. But rather than having a two-year timeline from the time you predict you need the drug to the time you get it, you'd have a two-week timeline. 
So uh, that drug has now gone commercial. In fact, um, we just launched the commercial production in April. It's, it's uh, being, uh, the yeast are being grown in um, uh, Eastern Europe uh, in a factory there. Sanofi uh, Aventis, a French pharmaceutical company, has licensed the process. Um, they are producing the drug, and then it goes to Italy, where it's uh, where they do the chemistry that I showed right here, and then it goes to Morocco, where it's tableted, and then it goes out to treat patients. And the first drug should be coming out any time now through this process. Um, there are about uh, 250 million people on the planet who have malaria at any one time, uh, and roughly a million people die of malaria every year, um, and 90% of them are children under the age of five. Having affordable, highly effective artemisinin could alleviate all those deaths every year. We hope that's the case. Now, it turns out that artemisinin is a hydrocarbon. It's, it's about very similar in composition to diesel fuel. Um, and about the time we finished this project, um, the U.S. was using the most foreign oil that it had ever used, um, and the price of oil was skyrocketing. This was uh, 2007, 2008. And we realized that this microbe we had engineered to produce a drug, a drug for poor people that needed to be extremely affordable, was a hydrocarbon. And that if we just pulled a few oxygens off that hydrocarbon, that in fact, we'd have a great diesel fuel <laughs> and maybe a great jet fuel. So uh, we started a company called Amaris, which is located in Emeryville, that's now working on producing these fuels. We also started a research institute in Emeryville called the Joint Bioenergy Institute, where we're engineering microbes to produce hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons that would be identical to the kinds of fuel that we now get from petroleum, so that when you fill your car up with a renewable fuel, you don't have to compromise on how you drive that car. You get the same kind of performance out of that car. You don't have to swap out the $3 trillion worth of transportation infrastructure we have now. Rather, we'll swap out some of the biology and engineer a microbe to produce a fuel that we can use in that transportation infrastructure. Well, it turns out that if you can do that, you can also engineer a microbe to produce a lot of chemicals we use on a day-to-day -day basis, like components in perfumes that would normally come from sharks. Rather than killing sharks to get those components that are in your perfumes, you can fire up the fermenters, and that yeast will actually produce those components. But what about all the other things we get from petroleum? If you just look around you um, at all the materials you're in contact with in this room, and I can just name some of them off, the carpet on the floor, the material on those seats, the paint on the seats, the paint on the walls, the material on this floor, all of these come in part or in whole from petroleum. We become addicted to petroleum. Not only is it fueling our cars, it's impacting every aspect of our lives. We can now start to produce those renewably, those same products we can get renewably. If you can replace the petroleum with a renewable fuel that goes in your car, you can replace all these products with renewable products. And that's where I think manufacturing, one of the ways manufacturing is going to be changing and changing in the US. And if you produce these using sugar or cellulose grown in the US, then those are jobs that stay here and it's money that doesn't go out of the country. And that's what our colleagues uh, and I are doing. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. So it looks like we have someone, why don't we go ahead and start right here with your first question. Well, um, for the first question, um, for you. Yes, in. Um, yes. Um, why do you speak so strongly that you do not use stains for your imaging system? The use of stains limits the ability to get quantitative information because you're now seeing what that stain has bound to rather than the structure that's really there. It also has the potential to change the structure. You know, you're looking at um, differential binding of the stain 
rather than the actual structure in total. But, um, Stains are very valuable, though. But um, it, it won't really change it that much. If you're using a radioactive form, say you're using like carbon-14 as your stain, then you wouldn't have any change in the chemical properties. Unfortunately, we can't see carbon-14 in our microscope. Okay. So we can see carbon, but we can't differentiate between the type of carbon. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to ask a question that connects something uh, from this talk, namely microbial engineering, with something from, I believe, the last science at the theater, which was uh, uh, global warming. I, I read recently that Georgia Tech has done some work with uh, NASA Airlines, and they found basically microbial communities uh, high in the air, well, above 30,000 feet. And I was wondering if um, it's possible to, instead of uh, bioengineering microbes to synthesize something, to perhaps break something down like a greenhouse gas, like a, a CO2 or a methane. And, and if so, uh, whether that's something potentially worth pursuing given, you know, uh, some of the potential unintended consequences of geoengineering. Yeah, you know, that, that um, is one of the first uses people thought of for, for microbial engineering, mostly in trying to build communities that would sit at factories that generate the greenhouse gases or, or at the site of generation of the carbon dioxide or methane or other things that you make that you don't want in the atmosphere. Um, and there, there are, in fact, natural organisms that will do that for you. Most of the carbon dioxide on the Earth, uh, well, a lot of it is processed by the ocean. And a lot of that's processed by microbes that live there and solidify and mineralize it into the ocean. The question is, is how much you would have to engineer, how many, what volume of microbes you have to engineer to impact, you know, the atmospheric carbon or atmospheric, um, you know, methane. And I think that that you know, um, it would be a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the concentration is. The answer, are, but, uh, yeah. but but I do think I do think that that engineering these communities to sit at the sites of action, at the factories, in your cars. Uh, and, and in other locations, I, I think we can do it at the site at which we generate, as well as using more renewable fuels and using more renewable ways of making things. Uh, having these two things together is be very, very important and, and certainly is on our, on our radar. I would just like to inquire um, uh, more about the artisan, or artem, 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 um production from yeast. You said it was more um, affordable and renewable, like, what, what, how is it more affordable than compared to like current art medicine productions and is it completely renewable, no fossil fuel involved, et cetera? Uh, so it, no fossil fuels involved. Mm. Uh, it comes uh, from sugar, although if yeah. the sugar mm. was planted by mm. or harvested by using tractors or something like that, um, mm. then you would, and those tractors ran on <laughs> petroleum based fuels, mm. then there'd be some uh, carbon put into the atmosphere. Um, uh, in terms of cost effective, right now it competes about even with the plant derived version. Um, if the plant derived version ends up going up much higher, then it will be much more affordable. The, the key when we started the project was actually to produce it at um, a level that wouldn't put farmers out of business, so they would still continue to grow the plant derived version. Um, and that uh, the microbial derived version would be there to stabilize the price and stabilize the swings. Ah. In the past, we've heard Mina Bissell in this venue talking about the effects of uh, the extracellular matrix on cancer. And I'm wondering whether uh, you or anybody is applying your techniques of uh, uh, simulation and uh, visualization uh, to this problem. So maybe I can speak to that. We, you be exactly working on that. What I actually had showed you is exactly that. These are cells embedded in a three-dimensional uh, matrix. And I think the reason why the matrix is there is because, the, or why it's important, is because the cells um, read out their tension. Cells are under tension. Cells are not relaxed. Cells are in a very tense state. And as uh, Carolyn pointed out, uh, that may well be a signal that, the, uh, that is needed to communicate to the nucleus that they are part of a tissue. And so if you lose the extracellular matrix, you, you lose that connectivity, you lose that tension, and therefore the cells start in migrating. Uh, they basically start an embryonic path. And they say, like, I'm not part of anything. I need to make something. So they're going to go out, and they're going to start making a tissue. And that happens to be a cancer. Thank you for your question. Do we have any more on this side? We are done. 
No more questions? Thank you, Berkeley Lab scientists. Thank you, audience. Remember, we'll be back uh, at Berkeley Rep on October 28th and December 2nd with programs. Please check our website, friendsofberkeleylab.lbl.gov, and you can find out what the programs are going to be. Thank you again for coming.